Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I think we'll get started. Can everyone hear me at the back? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so it's nice to see a, a full lecture theatre. Um, welcome to everyone. Uh, today we have a very special guest, Pedro Algorta. As many of you will know, Pedro uh, was one of the 16 survivors of uh, the 1972 uh, Andes disaster, uh, one of the most famous, incredible um, survival stories in, in, in all of history, really. And um, many of you will know the story that was uh, uh, immortalized in Piers Paul Reed's uh, book, Alive, which was published in 1974. Uh, such was the interest that it sold five million copies almost uh, off, uh, in, in its first edition. Um, and it's a story of great... Um, uh, courage and inspiration. It's an incredible story, and if you haven't read Alive, I, I thoroughly recommend you do it. Uh, so, um, after the trauma of the Andes and the euphoria of the rescue, 70 days trapped in the Andes, uh, Pedro sort of set about reconstructing his life and going about the task of living. He moved to Buenos Aires um, from uh, across the river uh, from Montevideo, where he uh, finished off his studies. He got a degree in economic sciences at the University of Buenos Aires. Uh, he then spent a couple of years in the States, where he got an MBA at Stanford University. Uh, and then he embarked on a, a, a very successful business career. Uh, he rose to senior positions in several companies in Argentina, uh, including CEO of the largest brewery in Argentina. So in recent years, Pedro has started talking about the Andes um, after a long self-imposed silence. And uh, this week sees the publication of his book, Into the Mountains, in the UK. And it is a fascinating book. There will be copies available to buy uh, on your way out. Uh, I'm sure if you ask Pedro nicely, he'll sign them for you. And um, it, it, it really is... Perhaps uh, there, there are several accounts by the survivors, but um, Pedro's account, I think, is, is one of the most raw and compelling of the accounts. And uh, it, it, it's a very worthwhile read. And some of the um, skills that he brought to the survival on the mountain, his capacity to work collaboratively, to work hard in a team, uh, he brought to his business career and, and, and I think made a, a great success of it. So um, I don't want to take up any more time. Pedro, please give a very warm welcome for Pedro Algorta. Thank you, John. Um, let me introduce you to John that will explain what I'm doing here. Uh, two years ago, I just had published my book in Spanish in, in Argentina, which has a rather different name. It's called The Mountains Are Still There. And uh, I have just published, then I received a call from one of my friends saying that there was a guy from Cambridge in England that wanted to, to see me, you know, wanted to ask some questions. And I say, OK, uh, let's, let's meet this guy that wants to, to, to ask some questions about the and stuff. So I met John. You know, he was in Buenos Aires. It was his second time into the Andes. He had been there where the plane had crashed. And then he came to Buenos Aires and, and wanted to talk to me as one of, of the survivors. And we had a a very nice conversation in a, one of the most expensive restaurants in Buenos Aires, <laughs> which he paid generously. <laughs> and then um, uh, he bought two copies of, of, of my book. And he asked me to sign the copies. Of course, I did. And then he said, uh, do you want 
me to translate your book. Well, that was a strange offer, you know. Uh, it was different that a guy come, coming from Cambridge, which I didn't know if he spoke or not Spanish at all, was going to translate my book. I say, okay, go ahead and then let's see what's, what, what's coming, you know. So a week later, I receive a memo with all the a proposal with dates and commitments, and then there was a really a plan to translate my book. Okay, go ahead. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, a few days later, say, okay, the first, the first installment is due in 30 days. I will send you uh, the first chapter of the book, and if you like it, I will continue with the others. So in 30 days, I received the first chapter of the book, was translated by John Guyver, and I realized that it was a better production than even the Spanish one, you know? <laughs> the Spanish had some errors, had mistakes, had some repetitions. John not only has translated my book into a beautiful English, but he had been able to, to translate and to transmit all what I wanted to say, even in the best way. So, he translated all the book. And at the same time, I found a publisher who, here in the UK who was willing to publish my book if I found a translator. So I have both things, a translator and a publisher. And therefore, we published the book. And then he came, why don't you come to Cambridge, to Microsoft, my place, my home, where I work, and uh, take us and speak about, about your experience the Andes and present your book. So, here, that's what I'm here, and I really think that this event, it's, uh, I, can, I can only uh, thank John of being here, that he, if without him, him I would have been able to, <coughs> to publish my book, and I wouldn't be able to, to be here with you. So thank you very much, John, for your generosity and cooperation, and, and because of you, this book has, has a, is a reality. Let me talk a little bit about the Andes, but before that, I would like to show you a very small video that would take us to 1972. La larga noche de sufrimiento ha quedado atrás. Tres helicópteros del Servicio de Búsqueda y Salvamento de la Fuerza Aérea de Chile se encontraban operando en la zona de los Maitenes, sector cordillerano de la provincia de Colchagua. Su objetivo, rescatar a los ocho sobrevivientes que aún permanecían en el lugar. Vistos desde el cielo, los restos del aparato uruguayo presentan una visión desoladora y terrible. Parece increíble que 16 personas pudieran vivir y convivir en tan inhóspito ambiente y más increíble aún la forma en que dos de los muchachos pudieron escapar de esa verdadera prisión de hielo enclavada en el corazón de los Andes. Helicópteros de la Fuerza Aérea que desafiaron peligrosas turbulencias lograron llegar hasta San Fernando con los ocho resucitados. Después, los primeros bocados de alimento en muchos días, los primeros exámenes médicos, las primeras palabras tranquilas. Los rescatados que actualmente reciben atención médica en San Fernando y que próximamente serán trasladados a Santiago son Roberto Canesa Hurta, Fernando Parrado Lodolbain, Pedro Algorta, Álvaro Mañino, Daniel Fernández. Pedro Algorta, 21 años, estudiante de Ciencias Económicas. También venía en el avión accidentado. De los primeros días fue un caos. Yo los primeros días quedé completamente inconsciente y después poco a poco me fui recuperando este, gracias a mis compañeros que me iban ayudando y al final soy de los que estoy mejor físicamente y al final era Dios de los que ayudaba a los compañeros. Los facultativos, asombrados por la vitalidad de los sobrevivientes, no han encontrado una explicación lógica al increíble suceso que conmovió a Latinoamérica. Las explicaciones de por qué y cómo lograron sobrevivir hay que buscarla en un campo distinto de la medicina y de lo científico. Lo que logramos nosotros no tiene ningún corte diferente, solamente un poco la fe en Dios y la fe en la vida. Bueno, no. considerando de que las... las... Los aviones no uno veía, dijimos la única posibilidad es salir con nosotros mismos, entonces decidimos que los, 
más fuertes salieron a sedicionar a donde estaban. Además, este, para nosotros esto no es un milagro, no es que Dios nos haya salvado así como para caída, sino que nosotros sabíamos que nos íbamos a salvar, nos organizamos para, que, para salvarnos y Dios nos dio fuerzas y, y nos salvamos. El grupo que se mantuvo con vida durante el largo lapso, alimentándose con chocolates, queso y líquenes, perdieron un promedio de 15 kilos. Nosotros nos, 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 nos cedían los alimentos para que estuviéramos fuertes a los posibles, a los que hacíamos las excursiones y fue realmente apasionada muerte, los demás comían poquísimo, y no había casi comida. Parece imposible comprender cómo todo ese grupo de alegres deportistas de rugby pudo sobrevivir a casi 4.000 metros de altura en las nieves eternas, más de 70 días, sin alimentos, sin ropas, y además rodeados por decenas de camaradas muertos. Indignación y molestia provocaron en los medios de gobierno las informaciones sensacionalistas y truculentas de órganos de prensa extranjeros y nacionales que se han dedicado a explotar el caso de los sobrevivientes del avión uruguayo. Eh, respecto a algunos... Enfoque un poco sensacionalista de nuestra prensa, tu opinión. Creo que la, la prensa de todo el mundo, en la prensa de todo el mundo hay prensa buena y prensa mala. La comprensión de un problema que fue de no ser entendido, pero este pueblo chileno que es tan cristiano, cristianamente se ha portado con nosotros, es lógico que lo entienda, como lo ha entendido. En el frío se quedan 29 amigos, 29 familiares, hombres y mujeres que cayeron en la dura batalla contra la violenta naturaleza nuestra. Bueno, hubo muchos periodos, porque al principio éramos 27, después hubo una luz y quedamos menos, después murieron algunos compañeros, ¿no? Y dentro de eso había altibajos, ¿no? Hacíamos excursiones, hicimos varias excursiones para buscarnos y, y, y a veces salía, salía yo, otra vez salía otro. No, hacíamos mochilas, hacíamos ropa, hacíamos frazadas, este, arreglábamos el avión. Yo creo que después de la aluvión recién salí para adelante. A estas informaciones optimistas del rescate se contraponen a nivel mundial dos hechos que empañan la Navidad. La guerra en Vietnam y el horrible terremoto que destruyó anoche casi totalmente a Managua, capital de Nicaragua. Well, I always enjoy showing this small film because of a few things. One is that there's no fiction, you know. It's, it's the real thing that were, was said when we were rescued from the Andes. These are the actual uh, news that appear on the, on, on the television in, in Chile. And it shows what we were saying 44 years ago. And I like to show this type of vintage film because uh, I realized that what I said 44 years ago is basically what I say now. Oh, it's my main message. My main message is that we were able to escape from the Andes not because of a, an act of God, but because we fought and we worked hard to get out of the Andes. You know, the, it is a miracle. Like a miracle is that we are alive. You know, we cannot explain things, but I can explain what happened there in the Andes. You know, I was able to survive and to live minute by minute. I know what, what we had to do. I know what we gone through, you know? And, and this is a story of, of hard work, of hard work made by normal people, common people. We were just a group of, a bunch of youngsters from, from Uruguay flying to play a rugby match in Chile. And we suddenly find this horrible scenario where we didn't know where we were, what to do. We didn't have any mountain experience, and any snow experience. There's no snow in Uruguay. We didn't know, knew what to do at all, you know? And step by step, question by question, you know, answering the things that we have to answer at that time without too much 
uh, forecasting what was going to come through, we were able to construct this, build this enormous survival machine that it was ourselves and the group, and the, the body group that we were able to, to build in, in the Andes. Let me tell you uh, two or three things about our experience. First, about the accident, don't ask me too much because I don't, I don't remember, you know? I can tell you a couple of things. I have images which are mixed up with all the stories that I've heard, with all the, 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 the times we have told the story. So I cannot separate what it is true or what it is my image, you know? Of course, I can speak about the accident. I will tell you a story, the story that I've seen in, in many movies. But I have some images which I know that it is our, our mind. For example, I re can remember the face of my, my brother Felipe, who was died just along my side. You know, that is in, in, not in any movie at all that has to be my own image. And why I cannot recall everything that happened? Well, one of the things that happened is that I was shocked. I was blocked, you know? I was, in a way, uh, protected. I cannot recall everything about that moment of so intense emotions that was the Andes, that uh, was the accident, you know? So, after the accident, I started to live my second life in the middle of, of the Andes, just in the bottom of the valley, which was the place where the plane had landed. You know, there we were. We were 45 passengers in that flight. We were flying from Montevideo in Uruguay to Chile to play a rugby match. And so suddenly, I remember that I woke up in that valley uh, with 18 of my friends already dead. Out of the 45 passengers, we were, we were 27 people who were alive. Some of us were without main injuries. Some of them had some injuries. But most of us were shocked, you know? shocked as emotionally shocked as a way of protection of what we had gone through. But in a few moments, we started to adapt to a new environment. We started, we have to learn to, to, do, to, to survive minute by minute what was going on. We were surrounded of dead bodies, you know? Our friends have died. Do you think that we were able to mourn, him, to mourn them? Well, that was impossible, you know? I remember some faces, I remember some bodies, but I don't remember being in, impressed of what that uh, scenario was. I was uh, just able to stand up to realize I, was, I didn't have any injury and went out of the plane. And when I went out of the plane, I realized that we were in the middle of the mountains, that we were covered by snow, the big mountains were all around, and there was a very low cloud that didn't allow us to see much further. And from there, from that instance where 27 guys completely shocked emotionally, well, we started to do the small things that we have to do to start living again and to start learning to adapt to the circumstances that we were experiencing. The first thing was to realize that we were alive, you know? We started to realize that we had to eat, that we had to drink water, that we have to protect ourselves from the cold. So we started to answer those basic and vital questions. How we were going to drink water, how we were going to produce the water from the snow, well, how we were going to feed ourselves. You know, we had some chocolate, some biscuits, some, some wine. Um, how we were going to protect from the cold. So, well, we opened all the bags and all that stuff and, and distributed and shared all the clothing that we had available. And at the same time, some characters, our personality, started to, to play a more important role in the group. At those, those times, I couldn't play a very important role. My level of emotional shock was quite high. I only could react to very vital impulses, just learning to how to drink, how to drink water, to sleep, 
to eat, and to start to rela relate myself with my friends. But some of them, for example, the captain of, of the team, which he was without any wound, he started to feel as a responsibility for the group. No, he had organized the flight. He had to give us some answers. And, and uh, he tried to convey the idea that sooner or later, we were going to be rescued. We don't have to worry. We have to keep tight that sooner or later, someone will, will come for us. But the days started to pass away. I remember the first night, very cold, horrible. But that night uh, gone through the second day, the third day. And when we were about a week there, uh, nobody had already came for us. We started to have some second thoughts whether they would come for us or not. I remember that we have a very small radio in which we can hear the news about our search. And we knew that they were looking for us. But nothing happened. One day, there was a plane that flew on top of us. And when they were flying just over our, our group, the plane made a movement with their wings. And when the plane made a movement with the wings, we understood that that was a signal. That we understood that what they were saying is that they have seen us, and that sooner or later, the day after today, maybe tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, they will come and, 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 and look for us. So there was a big emotion. We have been seen, we are going to be rescued, and we made a party. In the party, we had all our supplies. We had all the chocolate, the cookies, the wine, everything. So the next day, we were going to be rescued. The next day, we woke up early. We turned on the radio, trying to listen to the news, to start to find out how we were going to be rescued, trying to understand well, what we have to do. But what we heard in that, that radio that morning was completely the opposite. We heard that given the fact that we had been lost for more than a week in the middle of the Andes, there was no chance that anyone would, uh, would be alive. So the search was canceled. No, it was postponed until the weather would improve enough that in order that the thaw would allow the rest of the plane to come out and, 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 and someone would come up for our, our bodies. So that was the truth. That was what we heard. Nobody was, was going to, to, to come after, after us. So that was a very bad news. But I knew that at that time, at that point of time, we understood it as, as, as something that was as a signal. No? The signal was that we couldn't wait to be rescued. That if we were going to survive the Andes and to get out of the mountain, it was because of we take the responsibility of doing what we have to do. That we had to start working hardly in order to get out of the mountains. So we decided to, we started to talk how we were going to get out. We were made, going to make an expedition. We were going to improve the, the, the carcass of the plane, which was our house. We were going to do many things in order to stay there for one week more, two weeks, three months, whatever, until someone would come for us. But we had a problem. We had already taken care of all our supplies. We didn't have anything else to eat. And with that 10 days we have been there in the mountain, we were very weak. We were hungry, but not the hungry of eating something that you like. And very quickly, we were had the hunger of the weakness. You know, we have had the hunger that came from your stomach that makes you think slower, that you move very with difficulties, that you think that you are starting to get uh, tired, more and more tired. No? That was the hunger that we felt. So at that time, may, many of us at the same time realized that if we wanted to get out of the mountain, if we wanted to survive, we needed to feed ourselves from something. And we realized that we had the solution on hand. That was the bodies of our dead friends. The bodies of the dead friends would be able to give us the necessary energy to survive 
the Andes. So one day, without too much discussion, uh, we discuss it between ourselves, but because we need to do it, but not because we need to convince that we had to do it. One, a group of us went to one of the bodies, made a cut of a piece of glass, and we start to eat. And when we start to eat the flesh of one of our friends, we realized that we didn't did anything wrong. The only thing that happened was that we were able to cross a line, the line of death and, and life. So we started to eat at the, at the beginning with a big impression, just small parts, and then we started to eat everything. And we, get, when we, and we got used to live eating the, fre the flesh of our friends. That was the energy. That was, that was what connected us to, to life. That was what we needed to survive. That was what we were able to do to, to keep us alive. So without source of energy, without possibility, we realized that we have to work harder in a, being able to launch an expedition that was going to be able to get out of the Andes and bring help to the group. So we started to work hard thinking about how we were going to get out of the Andes, starting to select those who were going to be the expeditionaries. And we were working on that when we had uh, once uh, an avalanche. We, I remember that I was sleeping inside of the plane. It was at the beginning of, of the night. Uh, I, I think I remember that I was sleeping on the floor. I had a hand near my face when suddenly we heard a brick snow in the mountains. And suddenly tons of snow fall over the, fell over the plain and got inside the plain through the back part that was open to the mountain and covered completely the plain and inside the plain with snow. Suddenly, I was covered by the snow. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't incorporate myself. So I tried to move. And uh, at the beginning, the snow is porous. So I was able to inspire, and oxygen would come into my lungs, and I would be able to expand my lungs in my stomach and leave a space between my, my body and the snow. So I was able to continue breathing for a while until the snow freezes. And when the snow freezes, it turns into ice, and the oxygen didn't came through anymore. And when I was left out of oxygen, well, I tried to fight a little bit more of my life, but it was too, too complicated. <coughs> I started to feel very, very tired, you know? And I started to, to fall apart, to start to, to get asleep very quietly. And when I was almost gone, one of my friends was able to take the snow out of my mouth, and suddenly all the oxygen came back into my lungs. And when the oxygen came back to my lungs, I again felt the strength and the will to continue fighting for life. So a few minutes later, another of my friends grabbed my hand and took me out of the snow, first until my uh, uh, shoulders, then my waist, and finally I was able to, to, to get out. Those were the worst days I remember, you know? The worst days because I can't explain you everything that I feel and I felt. Not, as I said before, because of, uh, on the moment of the accident, which I'm protected, but I can recall everything that happened the day of the avalanche. An avalanche that was very costly, because on the other hand, eight more of our friends died that night. Among those who had died was my friend Marcelo, who was the captain of the team, who was so important at the very beginning, who said that we had to hold on, that they were going to come for us. But with time, he has been losing his position of authority because what he was saying didn't mean everything, anything to, to the others. And among the others who died that, that night was Liliana, who was the only woman that was still alive with us. And, that she, and she, played a, she had played a tremendous role in the first days, being a real mother for most of the, of the smaller children that were with us in the plane. The point is that this tragic avalanche also helped us a lot because it provided us with eight more bodies, eight more bodies that were absolutely significant. 
without those eight more bodies, we would have been able to arrive to the 70th day of, of our survival adventure. Now, after the avalanche, we have lost our captain. We lost everything. We lost the radio. We lost the machines. We had to start again. You know? We were just a couple of, of guys without an authority figure. We had to figure out what we had to do to, to be able to survive and to eventually get out of the mountain. So different people start playing different roles. You know? We had those who have a very big spirituality. Well, they become our priest and or organize all our prayers every, every evening, which was very important for the group. No? Regardless whether they believe or not in God, praying for all of us was very, very important. We also had our guys who were the engineers. Well, they tried to fix up the radio. They tried to fix up things. They tried to send signals, whatever they, they could. They were important for the group because they meant that technically we were also doing things to get out of the mountain. Well, so the medical students, the medical students, well, they graduated as, as, as uh, doctors over there in the mountain. They were able to fix bones and make uh, sutures and everything, you know. They really worked as, as doctors over there in the mountain. I was the intellectual, you know. It was not very useful to have an intellectual at that, that time. But I, I did my, I did what I had to do, you know. I tried to understand maps and, and to give some thoughts, to put some thinking in what we were doing. But all that was, was worthless. What was really worth is that I worked as hard as I could. I worked as hard as I could, and that was very, very important. It was important for me because it kept me focused on what was happening. It was important for the group because it was very significant that all the others worked, you know, that everyone do what he could do to, for him and for the group. And I think in that regard, all, our, um, all the things that we did were important. Not, not everyone was behaving well. Not everyone was a big leader. Not everyone knew everything about the mountain. Actually, we didn't know nothing about mountains. But with all the decisions that we did, with all the mistakes that we made, uh, with all the adjustments that we had to make to the group, with all the misbehaviors that we had within the group, we were able to, to adapt ourselves to what was going on and to survive day by day, making mistakes, making things that were very costly, but allowing the group to adapt and survive day by day there over there in the mountains. Finally, three or more, three of our friends died of other things, of wounds they had received before. And uh, at the end, uh, the first day of December, Numa Tukati died. He was going to be one of the expeditionaries because he was a very strong guy. But suddenly, he started to come down. And finally, he, he lost almost all his weight and died at the, the first days of December. And that was a call, you know, the call that we couldn't wait more, a call that, that uh, we have to respond in some way. So the day after, Canisa, Parado, and Vicentin, or three expeditionary, start a tremendous, a tremendous adventure. They started to climb the mountain that we had on our back. And they climbed that mountain for three days. Every day, a smaller spot in the wide slope of the mountain. They arrived to the peak. And when they got to the peak, what they saw was not the green valleys of Chile that they thought that they weren't going to see but they saw more and more mountains. And the, over there, they decided to continue walking. That didn't make any sense at all to get, to get back to the plane with the news that, again, they had failed. So they continued walking. And when they continued walking, they sent back to Vicentin to the plane with the news that they had started this, this incredible walk. Ten days later, we were still in the plane waiting for, for, for some news. And that day, I remember that we turned on the radio and we were able to listen that two people 
two persons have been spotted walking in the, in the Andes, and that they said that they were coming from the crash from the Uruguayan plane that had crashed 70 days ago. For us, that was a first view. Probably there were Canes and Parado. We, we didn't want to, we didn't got very emotional at the time, but in a few moments, we heard the news that confirmed that Canes and Parado were those two people uh, walking through the Andes. And that they say that 14 more guys were waiting risk to be rescued in the middle of the, of the mountains. So we were very happy. Imagine, finally, we were getting to the end of our trip. We were going to get rescue. So we prepared to get rescue. So we shared the money that we had. Uh, we made our list of errands that we were going to do, who we were going to call. We prepared ourselves to get back into civilizations. We didn't think at all that there was going to be any media over there, that we have done anything strange or anything that 40 years later I would be in Cambridge talking about it. We had just been surviving. We had just been trying to survive day by day. And we were getting to the end of the trip. So of course we were absolutely happy, but it was not an explosion of emotions because we have not died. We had not died for a minute. We had been alive always, every minute. You know, we couldn't we couldn't die for an instant. That was what kept us alive. Finally, towards midday of December 22nd, three helicopters came around us, flew over us. They they uh, threw some packages. Three members of the Chilean rescue team came to us, and I remember that I crossed them. I just ran into one of the helicopters, and when I got into one of the helicopters, a hat came out, grabbed me by my pants, and threw me into the helicopter. And in the helicopter, I found uh, Nando Parrado, who had, done the, who had undone the way that he had made walking through the Andes. And he guided the helicopter to where we were. And that's how we, we, we got out. The first day, we were uh, six out of the mountains, plus Canes and Parado, we were eight, and eight more stay one more day in the, in the mountain. And that's the story. You know, that's the story of the Andes. Three months later, I went back to school, and I put the mountain in my, mount, in my backpack and lived a normal life without, too many, without any nightmare, without too many things. And I think that the best and the most important thing that I can convey is the fact that even if you fall in a mountain, you can do a normal life. You can do a normal life means two things. One is the normal capacity of resiliency, the normal capacity of recovering, the normal capacity of living normal lives even, even after experience very hard situations. But the other side of that same coin is the fact that we didn't learn too many things. You know, I'm not a guru, I'm not a special person. I cannot give lessons of life. I just can only say that I experienced the Andes. I'm a normal guy, and I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. OK, we have uh, quite a lot of time for questions. And uh, let's pass the mic around. Thanks. Hi. Um, you mentioned that you had maps. But do you have any idea where you were on the maps or in what direction you should move? Well, we have maps, but we, weren't, we didn't have any idea where we were. It was impossible. We didn't, we didn't know where we were. Um, the pilots before dying had said that we had crossed the Andes, that we were on the Chilean side, that we had crossed Curicó, which is a city in Chile, you know? So we should be on the Chilean side. But where we were in a valley that opened itself to the east, to Argentina, 
and the mountains were much lower on the Argentinian side. But we thought that we were in Chile. We didn't have any mountain experience, so we made sort all of full of ideas where we were. Well, we didn't have a clue, you know. And the, the fact is that the first expedition went toward the east, down the mountain, uh, hoping that at some point of time the, 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 the valley will turn and will get take us to, to, to the west, to Chile, where we thought that we were. But the fact is that we were on the Argentinian side. And the right w way to get out of the mountain was exactly that way that we were seeing, that we had to continue down the mountain and open ourselves to, to, towards the east. So we didn't, we didn't really know where we were. Any other questions? Okay. Have you ever wanted to and have you returned to the crash site? I'm sorry. Have you ever wanted to return to the site of the crash and have you done that? Yeah, I went two times. I went in 1993 with, uh, with uh, 13 of my friends, of my brothers of the mountain. It was a very nice experience and it was very touchy. And then I went back about three years ago with my wife. That was an extraordinary trip. And uh, what I found there is that the mountains are still there and we have been able to, to continue walking. You know? And as I said before, the mountains are still there is, 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 is the name of, of the Spanish of the Spanish book, um, the mountains are still there, and I'm, I'm, and I'm in Cambridge now, you know, but happily they are there. Which also speaks about the fragility of a human being, you know, they are so big, so huge, so unsensible, and uh, they cannot move, but we are much more fragile and, and, and can move. Um, it is a beautiful place, uh, full of mystery. Jonah has been there twice. And uh, maybe I'll go once more there with some of my children or my grandchildren, if, if I have time. When I, um, when I first read this, uh, uh, the story of this back in the, the 70s, mm. um, I seem to remember reading uh, a story that um, if you'd gone in a particular direction, there was supposed to be a cabin where you, uh, which you could have uh, sheltered. Is that true, or is that just uh, newspapers of the time? Well, it's true. You know, it's it's what I said before that we should have uh, we should have uh, walked uh, east, and that is the way out. And today, the way to get to the place is through Argentina. So, through, so that was the way out. Uh, but the truth is that we don't know. Because the, the, the walk is not an easy one anyway, you know. And maybe uh, our expeditioners would have arrived to a, a, a cross of rivers, you know. And they could not, maybe they could not cross the rivers and would stay there for weeks and, and, and starve over there. We don't know whether they just fall into, a, were walking through the wrong side of, of the river and they just fall into a, into a crevice. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure, but what it is true is that the way out was through the east where two or three days of walk, there is a cabin and, and a little bit more, there, is a, there, is a, there are soldiers over there. So th th there's life, you know, That's, that was the way out. Well, we did it the wrong way. We did it the difficult way. Uh, and the, the good thing is that even if you do it the wrong way and you try hard, <laughs> you, may, you may get to it. To where you want to go. Yeah, I, just to add to that, I mean, it is very difficult terrain down on the Argentinian side, and it is, there's a lot of, even when you get out of the Andes, it's a very sort of <sighs> desert like um, terrain, so there's a good chance there wouldn't be anyone there. There's a massive river down at the bottom of, of the mountain that they would have had to cross, so it's, it's certainly by no means clear that they would have been rescued if they'd gone that way. Um, Hello there. Um, I read the first bit alive and Narado's book, and there was photos of several reunions. Um, but 
there was no no photos of you. Did you did you not feel that you wanted to attend, or was it just uh, just that you weren't in the photo? In alive, hmm? in alive, in alive. No, in a, a Nara, Nara, in a Narado's book, uh, Mir- Miracle in the Andes. Miracle in the Andes. It's yeah. a beautiful book. Yeah, yeah. it's a beautiful book. Um, I don't know why if there are no pictures, but it should be around. There was pictures of fifteen people, uh, and, oh, really? it, and it said that you you weren't oh. in the photo. But I didn't know if it's because you weren't there, or you just weren't weren't on the photo, or whether you didn't attend reunions. No, so you did. I, I didn't realize that, you know. But in in the book Alive, I mean the, the picture, so not maybe in Parado's book, but in Alive, the one that wrote Pierce for Reed uh, wrote, I am there, which is what it's also true that in the movie Alive, I die. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a shock. <laughs> uh, my character, my character doesn't get to the end, you know. So uh, uh, the, the the authors needed some type of, of of characters, and I didn't. Probably the actor that portrayed my role was not good enough, so they decided <laughs> to to kill him. But the truth is that the, um, during 35 years, I care less about this. I was too busy working. I was very busy improving my tennis and my golf and working hard and, and, and taking my children to school and doing whatever I have to do. And I had this thing in my backpack there in the corner in my room. And sometimes, well, para- I was writing a book, and so I go and see this movie. I, wanted to, I, I went to see some of, of my friends speak to, to hear what they say. Hey, what are they speaking? Why people are interested in what they, they say? I didn't I really didn't get it, you know. Um, when the movie was made, I, I took my children and we went to Canada. They were were they were filming the movie, and I met my my actor who, who was going to die in a few days, and uh, but I didn't thought I had to do anything with that. On the other hand, I was working hard, you know, and I didn't want to divorce myself between coming here and expose and open my heart and telling all the few beautiful things we did and the not beautiful things we did there in the Andes. And it's an exposure that you had to be prepared to take, you know. When I was CEO of the company, I was not able to, to mix both things, you know. I just couldn't do it. So I worked hard and once I retired from, from the company, they say, what am I going to do? One of the things I did was look back, look back and found my mountain was there in the corner and I start looking into it. And one of the things that I found is that the way I lived this story, that the way I experienced, the way I interpret what happened to us in the mountain is completely different than the way Parado does or Roberto does or Carlitos does or whatever, you know? And each one of us has a, has a different story to tell. You know, all true, you know, Parado's story is wonderful and he portrays himself as a hero, which he is, you know, because he lost his mother, his sister over there, he walked 10 days over the Andes, and he really is a very strong personality. That's fine with him. It was not mine, you know. I just worked hard over there in the mountains. I, learn to survive, not only to the mountains, but I learn to survive the group, you know? I have to play the dynamics of the group. And I can recall that. Parado doesn't care about the dynamics of the group because he will have a strong character. I had to survive Parado, too, you know? <laughs> so from my point of view, it's a different story, no? And I wanted to tell this story, the story of someone who survived 70 days, who worked hard to survive, who was important to the group, but I was not a hero, you know? I was not the guy to have the, that had the flag and say, hey, come, come and follow me. I didn't do that, you know? I worked hard. My example, my, my hard working was important for the group, but basically, I worked for me, you know? And working for me, I was able to work for the group. Nevertheless, the way and the role I play there in the mountain is very similar to the way I then experienced my role as a CEO of a company. You know, I didn't have all the guys on my back saying, let's go this way. I was much more cooperative guy. 
I went with my people. I stayed there. And when you see the picture of of the good of, of the group. Here, if you open the, the book, you will see there's a group of guys sitting, sitting on, on, on my left. No? There's a group there. That one is Roberto Canesa, who's one of the guys who walked. Uh, he's a great guy. I'm the one sitting on top of the plane, you know, having an overview, over, overseeing what goes going on, being in touch but without getting inside in, in the middle of the group. That was the way I survived the Andes. That was the way that I lived then, after, in my corporate and my business life. <coughs> yeah, I should just say I, I looked up the actor that played Pedro in, uh, in, in Alive, and that was the only film he, he actually made. So, <laughs> so, so not only was he killed off in the film, but uh, that was his last one. The radio you refer to... Sorry? The radio that yeah. you refer to, that you heard up to seven days, they giving up the search, was that the planes radio, or was it an independent radio that someone with batteries someone brought along? Oh, it's a battery radio. How do you conserve the batteries if you were listening... I don't know. Regular? Yes, OK. It's a, it's a miracle. It is. <laughs> I don't know. Well, the, the fact is that we had this radio. Yes. At the beginning, we were able to, to hear the news. Um, then the radio disappeared in the, in the avalanche. We lost it. And it came back with a thaw. And when it came back, we were still able to hear some things. So it's, uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. Do you, have the, do you know the brand of the radio? <laughs> it was a speaker. Speaker or spiker? I don't speaker, know. yes. Speaker. Very small one. Huh? We are not sure if it was brown or, 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 or black, you know, <laughs> because it's a discussion whether it was black or brown, but uh, it was a speaker, you know, that, that was the radio. The radio of the airplane gave us a lot of, of headaches because we intended to, to fix it up in order to, to send a signal, but the radio was on, on, on the cockpit, so it was there, but the batteries of the radio were on the tail, and the tail was two kilometers, two kilometers down, down the downhill. Okay. So we made the excursion there, came back. We sent people. They spent a week over there trying to connect cables and all that stuff. And finally, we were not able to do anything at all. Uh, people who understand more about this say that it was impossible that we could have uh, made that radio work. But we spent a lot of time trying to make it work. And uh, between, inside the dynamics of the group, we are those that were uh, following the idea that we had to continue working on the radio, and those that we had the idea that we had to forget the radio and start doing something else. Were they electronic students or physics students or engineers, were they? No, it was a matter of character. Okay. You know? um, Roberto Canesa wanted to fix up the radio. He was going to be one of the guys who was going to walk, but he was scared to death, you know? And he always was trying to find uh, ways to, to stay there, you know? Because being in the, in the, in the, in the carvers of the, of the plane was our home. Yes. We, were, we felt relatively safe, uh, safe over there, you know? Uh, it was hard to, uh, to start walking into the no land, you know? We didn't know anything at all what was going there. So he had these mixed feelings, you know? And, and, and finally, when Turkati died, well, we decided that this was the time to start and, and do other things. When we left the mountain, when they started walking, we were 14 in, in the, alive in the plane. We have been dying, you know? Two, three days, one dead, uh, three days, one dead. When they started walking, no one else died. You know? The group, in a way, felt uh, we were able to, 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 to stick to life. And when they come to rescue, the 14 that were alive, when they started walking, we were still alive that day. Coche and Roy would have lasted 48 more hours, 
but the 14 that, that were alive when the, these two guys started to walk, well, we have been living for, 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 for that time since then. Amazing. Nevertheless, last year, uh, Javier Metol died. He was is one of the is is the first one of the group that passed away, but he died because he was 79, which was nothing to do with the mountain. Mm -hmm. So you had a question as well. Yeah. Um, do this gentleman first, and then we'll come to you. Hi, sorry. Um, during your time in the mountains, do you recall there being any arguments between you and your I'm friend? Sorry? During your time in the mountains, were there, do you remember any? Arguments between your friends, or was it always? Yeah, quite well, positive? we had a lot of, of, of discussions. You know, if we were not a group of, of friends that didn't have anything to discuss, not at all. We we fought hard among ourselves. We fought uh, for authority positions in the group. You know, uh, we fought to be in the center of the group. You know, my fight was to be taken account within the group. If I was taken account. I would be able to sleep in the best places. I was, I was going to be able to fit better. You know, I would be able to have more uh, rights than others that, that wouldn't fight for themselves. So all those things happen in, in our group. We even have our scapegoats. You know, in groups like that, you need to have scapegoats in order to expel the tensions that you create in the group. You know, and we have one of them. There was it's my friend Pancho who, I don't know why, because we all stole food as we could. We all those things that, in order to be ourselves at the group, decided that he was going to be the, the, the bad guy. You know? And if you read the uh, uh, Pierce Paul Reed book, you will find that he is, uh, in a way, the, the, the scapegoat of, of a group. And 40 years later, I'm a close friend from Pancho, and I laugh at the fact that he has been designed the scapegoat, which is a tremendous uh, uh, unfairness to him. Because we all did whatever we had to do to survive. You know? But in a scenario like that, one, we needed to have a scapegoat where to, to, to pinpoint the problems of the group. <coughs> but of course, we have fights. You know? We did the kill each other, nothing like that. But when you have people adapting to a, such a situation, you, you have tension, you know? And when you have tension, you have arguments. Because uh, the, there were very few resources, and we fought for survival. OK, last two questions, one here. Hi. Um, for someone who the film producer has decided was dead, you've spoken to us very eloquently. Thank you. You've mentioned resilience and resistance of human beings. Yeah. You've also mentioned briefly faith. Um, was that something that was very important to you personally and as a whole group, a faith yes. in your survival? Yes, absolutely. Faith in the survival, faith that we were going to get out. Not that we were going to get out. There was a chance that we were going to get out. You know? We were not sure that we were going to get out. But we knew that we had the possibility of getting out. And we stick to the possibility. And we work hard as if we were sure to, to get out. So we work as if we were going to get out, although we knew that it, we might not get out. So that, that's, that's important. Faith that we were going or that we had the possibility of getting out. We also were Catholics. Most of us. Some of them didn't believe in God at that time. I believed in God. But we prayed very much. Every evening, we prayed a rosary. That was very important for the group. It would give us the necessary calmness to endure that night. You know, It would give us the necessary calmness to heal our wounds among us. You know? And every, every day, we went to sleep in quietness. And that allowed us to rest that night and gave us strength to start the new day with the hope that that might be the last day. I didn't think that we were going to survive because of an act of God, that suddenly I would woke up in my bed in Buenos Aires and, and realize that there was 
just a nightmare. I didn't think about that. I only thought that I needed God's strength, God to give me the necessary strength to, to continue fighting for life each day after each day. Some of my friends had a different view. Some of my friends believe that we were saved by an act of God. Others are atheists, and they think that God didn't have anything to do there. I believe he was with us. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very last question, because we're already over time. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, because you found out that they were they'd taken off the search very early on, I was wondering why it was so long before you went for the decision of sending a party to walk out, and were there other things you were trying other than the, the plane radio or anything else you were hoping out for? Well, the fact is that it took us the first days, well, it took us the first weeks or whatever to get used to where we were, to realize where we, where we were. Remember, we didn't know anything at all about mountains, no, whatever. We had many people wounded. We didn't know what to do. You know? And on the other hand, it was just starting of spring. It was still snowing. There was a lot of snow. I think that if we decided to walk out to the mountain in the first days after the accident, it was just being impossible. You know? One thing is to walk in the mountain in spring with a lot of snow. And the other thing is to walk in, in summer with much less snow. You can go there in, in March, which is the end of the summer. You cannot go there in, in any other period of time of, of, of the year because it is, it is, it is it's not possible. So it took time. You know, uh, We wouldn't have been able to do it before, although we tried and we failed. You know? And the expedition that went into the tail, I went an expedition for three or four hours uphill and uh, found uh, the wing of the plane over there. They came back, then I came back. We were continue trying, failing, learning, and trying another thing, you know? And we tried zillions of things. For example, things that we didn't do that we should have done. For example, we should have tried to burn one of the tires of the, of the plane. Maybe a black smoke will come out from, from, the, from one of the wheels and uh, from the tires, and people would, would see us. But it did not just occur us. We didn't think about it. Huh? No, nobody say, hey, let's, let's burn this tire. We, it just didn't occur us ourselves to do it. Well, people, you have been very, very generous. And I appreciate being here. And I thank, again, my friend, translator, and co-author of my book, uh, John Giver, and uh, if someone wants to have my book and a signature on it, I will be more than willing to do it. But again, uh, thank you for coming. This is part of my healing process, you know, speak about it and realize that it's fun to do, you know, okay, that well, the mountains are still in the back. Okay. Thank, 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 thank you very, very much. much. Thank you.